morning everyone we're just going to allow everyone to uh, join us this morning uh, and we will get started in in just a couple of minutes So good morning and welcome to our quarterly webinar. Uh, we're entering Q2 uh, 2023 and uh, the sun is still shining here in the UK. Um, we're certainly in the midst of our spring summer season in the sector. Um, some real positives in that we've definitely seen that easing on the cost of shipping, which has been a topic we've debated at length uh, over the last 12 months. But there are still um, some big inflationary pressures out there that we know all of you will be still having concerns around. So as normal, we'll be looking to take you on a journey with us today, share our insights into this sector, share what we are seeing, um, both from our clients, but also from our market insight reports that we do. And we hope you'll enjoy the session. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Sophie Michael to start off our session today. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks, Laura. Morning, everyone. Um, I have the next slide, the graph. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> for those who are not familiar with our high street sales tracker, it tracks like for like sales across discretionary spend categories of fashion, lifestyle and homeware. And it tracks it both online and in store. And these numbers really do continue to um, be difficult to interpret. And that's largely because we are still interpreting them against benchmarks which have been impacted by um, quite significant volatility um, due to a number of, of events, but also high inflation. What is clear though, is that the like for likes that we are seeing is below inflation. And that therefore translates into volumes continue to drop. As we know, inflation continues to be above 10%. It was hoped that it would fall to single digits, although the expectation was only at 9.9%, but we saw the figures out yesterday at 10.1% against the previous months of 104 But what is more staggering, especially in connection with the impact that it has on discretionary spend, is that food inflation is running at 19.2%. And that inevitably therefore means that a larger proportion of the purse is being taken up by a central spend. So looking at February, the light for lights were at 6.4%, but the online was actually negative at 1.2%. And for March, it grew by 4.1%. And these are absolute terms. Um, and um, we saw a small increase in online at 2.8%. So those figures are clearly showing that volumes are dropping. There are some positive signs. We saw reports last week that Britain will be avoiding a recession. The big supermarkets are focused on reducing prices, although that's not what's coming out of the um, food inflation prices. But it's going to take a lot more um, positive news and it needs to be for a consistent period in order to lift that consumer confidence, which is, it, it is sitting at historic Le low levels and quite stubborn in terms of shifting. When we look at the graph on the right hand side, you can see just how volatile it, it is. And also that actually online and in, um, in store are following similar patterns. So whatever channel that the um, retailers are trading through, it, it, it's a challenging um, sell to the consumer. Next slide, please. 
when we look at it by category, fashion has up until now been, been leading the way. And this might have been because it was against weaker comparatives, but also we did see an increase in vacations and people perhaps updating their wardrobes for those vac vacations and new seasons. But March fashion was flat at just 0.7%. And that's the worst performance that fashion has seen in two years. Lifestyle was the best performing um, sector in March. And that, that was boosted by Mother's Day week as well. So the impact of inflation is really challenging for all sectors, but in particular for retailers, because discretionary spend categories in particular are really being squeezed by the, the bigger slice being taken by central spend. Um, so retailers have been squeezed by two fronts. Consumer spending is falling, while they're, they're um, also having to deal with higher costs themselves and increasing their prices. So it's really, really um, difficult to navigate these times in terms of creating that balance of continuing to focus on where they can cut costs but at the same time, as we know, continuing to invest in order to retain and build their brand positioning and provide that customer with the experience in order to entice them to part with their cash when it's already a really stretched purse for that essential spend. So it's not as positive or promising as I would have li liked to have delivered. I'm hoping that perhaps at the next webinar I can give a, a, a more positive picture and indeed, if um, the government holds to its promise and we see those inflation figures coming down, me, we may well see some confidence seeping back in and people beginning to spend more. With that, I'm going to pass over to Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so as Sophie indicated, this data is collated by a number of retailers and obviously tracks actual behaviour that's going on. Um, if we just go to the next slide, what we then try and do is, um, one more slide, sorry, is to look at what the consumer is uh, saying in terms of their intent. So here is um, uh, quite a busy slide, but what we've got here is the net spend intention by a number of different categories. So whilst we recognise that consumer sentiment towards uh, retail and spending is low, when we look at the blue line, which indicates in the last six months how people have been spending, we can see a slight positive move up to the red line, which is the predicted spend in the next six months. And that spend intention grows in some of those discretionary categories. So as Sophie mentioned, there is a slightly more positive tone from the consumer indicating that some of these sectors, um, they might want to be um, getting back out there and spending. if things uh, from a kind of macroeconomic perspective go their way. Next slide, please. The one concern that is uh, on people's minds is, can they afford to be changing their behavior in any way? And this um, is a chart which looks at the change in savings. And we ask the question, how um, do you anticipate your spend or impact your savings in the next six months? Now, the blue is that actually their, their savings will increase and the orange is that their savings will decrease. So the net line on the red means lots of people in most of the income brackets, other than those over 150,000, are considering that their savings will probably be impacted in the next coming months because of the cost of living. Um, whether they've got those savings to actually carry on and um, behave and consume in the ways that they had previously, isn't that clear, but it does show that people are more concerned of their ability to afford um, probably more of the discretionary items. Next slide, please. And what we then look at is kind of wave on wave. So we do this survey quarterly and try to understand where is the movement and can we see some categories which actually could be bouncing back more positively. Um, at the bottom, not necessarily retail, but holidays continues both in the headlines and from a consumer sentiment perspective to be a category people are prioritizing. And we've seen bookings and the spend intention um, very, very positive. If you then look at a couple of others, a notable change in child and baby. So that has um, markedly improved. 
in terms of consumer sentiment towards spending in the next six months. Um, and other areas are just nudging up. So there's more encouragement on eating out and drinking out and in clothing and, and footwear. I would say that the positive 5% movement in clothing is still a negative. So there is pressure on clothing and footwear as a category. Next slide, please. But what are people going to do if they can't continue their behaviors in the same way? So this looks at the behavioral changes against some of these everyday and discretionary items. Um, now how to read this is if you take beauty and personal care, which is the first column, most people are indicating they're going to make fewer purchases. But as you go down this, you can see some elements of interesting um, behavior. So in pet care, for example, a lot of people are considering actually, I might just buy more in bulk because they'll save more and I've got the ability to do so from a space and a, and, a, and a cash perspective. The use of loyalty programs is quite interesting and is more so around beauty and, and um, clothing. And then when you look at the postponement of purchases, it seems like those bigger ticket electrical items or, or big other furniture items seem to be ones that consumers are very happy to postpone. So there's different ways that consumer is trying to change their behavior to still consume, but possibly in a different way. And the use of offers, as the third line suggests, is gonna be quite important for a number of categories. And I think that's where retailers and brands are really focused on trying to excite the consumer with interesting offers, but do so in a commercially savvy way. Next slide. And finally, in terms of how people then might change in terms of switching, what we also asked is by category, how much might those people be um, convinced to switch behaviors out of a brand or a retailer they love into a new one? And you can see that groceries has a significant amount of brand switching at the moment. And you can see the wars between German discounters and Tesco is quite considerable. And um, we saw the, the advertisement um, ruling on the, the Tesco club card uh, imagery could be a potential impact on, on how they are um, showcasing what has been a very good promotion around their club card loyalty points. But you can see here that the consumer is both saying, one, I will postpone purchases when necessary, but I will look around. I will look and seek a more value oriented retailer and or switch brands um, at varying levels but it is something that I think the consumer is mindful to do. And with the ease of, of shopping online, and Sophie did indicate that we are slowing in terms of our um, store growth. We obviously had a very big boost of people getting back out in stores and that light for light growth in stores is, is somewhat coming down. And that online is starting to become a little bit more favorable. So as people research more, understand new brands and look out for those offers and discounts, you will see people possibly switch brands and therefore loyalty can be impacted. I believe that's the last slide. I'll just double check and pass one slide more and then I'll pass back to Laura. Thanks, Tom. And with that, I'm actually going to ask a number of my colleagues that perhaps haven't been on our webinars previously to join me for a session that we felt would be quite insightful um, for people. Um, when we reflect on the conversations that we've been having with clients, whilst there has been a lot of noise around COVID, the challenges of inflation, one of the things that is very much still top of their agenda is post Brexit that they've all encountered. A lot of people had to race to set up international operations and are still struggling to wade through the significant issues and complications that that has brought to businesses that are looking to either import or export from the UK. And so what we felt we would do this morning is to have a discussion with uh, a few of my colleagues on how that area is really driving change for clients, but also how perhaps you should think about a few things can, that can help you optimise and certainly make those global supply chains more efficient. So, Ross, starting with you, optimizing a global value chain, yeah, it sounds complicated. We put some big words up there. Um, you know, 
try and simplify that for for me. Yeah, sure. So, so essentially, it's about trying to find the most effective way to take your particular product or service to market. And and really, when when we look at it, it is it is a huge and potentially complex topic um, because it touches governance, legal, legal structure, IP ownership, development and exploitation, your contracting model, your systems, processes, HR policies, including incentivization, tax, and supply chain. And so, really, it's about finding a a, a methodology to step through that in a structured way. And so what we'd always do is break it down into a few different phases of work, but the first really being a current state assessment of what does it look like today? Where are the risks? Um, where are the opportunities? And essentially starting to tease out that, that business case um, for change. Um, and then that current state assessment, if you do that in a really focused way, it gives you an idea of where the key um, risks and opportunities in your organization lay. And, and then you can move on to the next phase of really designing um, the blueprints for that, that future um, state and testing potential variants to that, to address any identified risks and opportunities. And then moving um, to the implementation phase um, of, of getting that design over the line. And, and it may be the case that you don't need to look across all of those different components of the global supply chain, uh, the, sorry, the global value chain. It may be, for example, that what really needs to focus right now is the supply chain, or perhaps it's around governance or legal structure, and there's ways to break that down. But really important that those uh, where it is broken down in that way, it's not looked at in a silo because we see issues arise when things are looked at in a silo without understanding the true sort of interdependencies and adjacencies that exist there. And taking all of those points, Ross, and, and just trying to filter a few down, when we're talking to clients about some of the issues of European operations, people have gone and put European operations in to help them mitigate some of the Brexit issues. But, but Stephen, pulling you into the, the conversation that we're, we're having here, you know, there's a lot of money that people are leaking or certainly cash flow and working capital challenges that people are experiencing by some of the delays, issues, paperwork that they're seeing as a result of these new EU operations they've set up that perhaps have to do very quickly. And so they're they're now in some ways having to backfill where they where they've got to. So if any thoughts from you as to a few pointers to the audience on, on what they should be thinking about some of the cases perhaps we've had where where we've seen people in these issues and where we've been able to, to make a real difference. Yes, so I'll bring in Stephen in a second as well on the on the supply chain side of things. But I mean, interestingly, we're still seeing a number of organizations reshape their structure as a result of Brexit. Um, so there's a long tail of issues that are emerging around Brexit with just general clunkiness um, sort of arising in, in supply chains and distribution models that um, maybe they weren't business critical, but they, they are proving to still be problematic. So a lot of organizations are looking quite carefully about at their supply chain. And, and that's been sort of triggered by events in the macroeconomic environment as well in terms of uh, sort of ensuring that there's a resilient supply chain in place. So we're seeing a, a huge amount of supply chain change. And there's quite a lot of opportunities actually that emerge when you start looking at that in detail, because so many things have changed over the past few years and often supply chains have not kept pace with with really finding um, the opportunities that that exist or addressing the risks that that are present there and maybe that's something Stephen could touch on a bit more certainly thank you Ross so I think the best the best way to talk about this is through through a worked example we're, we're working with a business at the minute who put processes in place to ensure that they continue to service EU customers after brexit and it was only when they looked at the customer experience that they realised that they were leaking import VAT in the EU. So a change to their structure, a change to how they operate their supply chain into the EU has, to cut a long story short, increased their profitability on EU sales by 8%. And that is just through change in the arrangement with freight forwarders setting up their EU subsidiary. It's a significant amount of money. Uh, and, and we know that there's other businesses that this can be helpful for. So any, anybody anybody who's got UK UK face for the EU distribution or vice versa can be thinking about these things and it can really be helpful to bottom line profitability. Stephen, are, are we still seeing 
and issues of delays due to products trapped on on the border. We clearly saw over the Easter holidays some of the delays back at the the borders into to France, which was making the headlines around holiday makers. But in terms of <clears throat> just what we are seeing with clients and how they're operating in that EU cross border position, anything that we're seeing, any thoughts on on what people should be thinking about to try and smooth out, as Ross said, that supply chain, because you know, for for businesses where working capital is all, already at a pressure point and taking Tom and Sophie's point, we're still seeing those headwinds in our sector. You know, even the small points we might be able to share could be quite useful. Yeah, thanks, Laura. So generally speaking, the movements are going okay. People tend to be able to get things where they need to. Often they're just not optimised. So what we'd recommend is that people just take a step back now and think about are you getting the best value for the supply relationships that you've got? Have you got optimal outcomes to the arrangements that you've got? Should you be going and speaking to suppliers and customers and saying to them, look, is there something we can do here to arrive at a better position that's beneficial to both parties? Because these tax havens can be beneficial in two ways. Yes, they can put more money into your pocket as a business owner, but they can also allow you to reduce your prices a little bit and become more competitive in the markets that you're operating in or give you more, mon more money to go and uh, fund business growth. So there are still issues out there and there are still people who are, who are suffering because their competitors have done this optimization and are a more viable proposition in the markets that people are selling into. They're really interesting. And this this global proposition, this this global infrastructure is now something that the majority of people who are working even very closely to home but outside of the UK are having to face. So Laura, just, just an insight to you around how perhaps some of our clients have sought to efficiently create those operations from an outsource type model versus having to set up sister companies in every territory sort of any examples where where we can point to that that might give food for thought again yeah um thanks laura so yeah obviously we are seeing a lot of, of change in terms of um the way businesses are operating overseas so things like you know we obviously saw businesses setting up in europe post brexit we're also seeing some changes around shortening of supply chain because of supply chain pressures and actually near shoring um, some activities. So that obviously gives rise to activity in jurisdictions and um, you know countries that businesses haven't uh, haven't operated in before. Um, and there's some complexities that you know that, that sit around that and there's lots of things to, to think about operationally clearly, but also from a sort of financial point of view um, and the, the financial operations and the systems and how all of that hangs together, in the most cost effective um, and streamlined way for businesses. So um, it sometimes come as a, comes as an afterthought, some of those financial areas, because obviously it's all about getting goods into the right place from a cost perspective um, and getting those supply chains working efficiently. Um, but yeah, we're definitely seeing um, more activity globally, uh, UK companies setting up in various jurisdictions. Um, and with that, as I say, comes some complexities. Um, and that's where sort of, you know, our teams come in and BDO um, and some of the guys on the call here in terms of making that as easy as possible um, for, for businesses who have a presence overseas, um, actually working through what that means. <laughs> what are they actually doing there? And what does that, you know, what complexities does that then add to the business that uh, needs thinking through as part of that sort of change in structure, if you like? And that outsourcing model where you've got a, a UK headquarter and you've got operations, for example let's say we've got operations over in, in Germany, yeah. that outsourcing model, do you think it's a cost-effective way? And also, can you, can you truly outsource the fundamentals around finance, around um, some of the operations that would mean that the UK guys have got a separate team that's got a manager overseas? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of success stories around that. Obviously, it's horses for courses. Every business is slightly different, but it's all about how you can streamline things. So um, we have a really um, one of the services at BDO that we provide um, that, that kind of meets that need is actually a, um, a locally delivered but centrally coordinated 
service. So um, we get all the local nuances of doing business in different countries, Germany, France, wherever, in terms of, you know, just financial reporting, payroll issues on the ground. We have teams that can do that. Um, but the ease for the business is that it can all be managed from the UK. We have separate teams that can do that in terms of that coordination. And that in itself is just, if you think about it from an administration and a cost saving point of view, um, that's where the benefit lies, you know, because we, we have the expertise that we can bring in locally that if you had to go and, you know, sort out yourselves, employ people to on the ground to, to look out for you, um, all of that's taken away. It's just in a more efficient, streamlined way. And, you know, local laws and things change all the time. So it's just being that one step ahead and being proactive, I guess, for, for those businesses on the ground. And, and I'd, I'd maybe just add one point to that as well, which is, and it seems like an obvious point, um, cultures are clearly different um, in different countries around the world. And that definitely flows through to the way financial um, systems are, are run and managed in, in different territories. And, and I think another key benefit of the, the, central, the central visibility is helping to translate effectively where those cultural differences are going to manifest in the need for different processes and procedures in a particular market. You know, what are the challenges to watch out for? What are the, what are the things that UK businesses heading into that market tend to struggle with and having an advanced um, view of that so that you can sort of put the right processes in place rather than trying to chase your tail down the line. And Ross, picking up that point, um... You know, in terms of when we look at that whole piece of a global value chain, that, that bit where you, you stand back as a UK operated business and you, you look out globally and think about you know, how you how you make sure you do it the right way, both today but, but also for the long term, putting those building blocks in, in place. If, if you were to give a couple of examples of, where people should be focusing their thoughts on you know that that planning that preparation but even if they've got um got those operations already set up picking up Stephen's point of just taking the time to go and speak to the stakeholders around you to get that insight as to how you could do things better not only might save you a bit of money but also allow you to be more agile when the consumer attention is continuing to be a challenge so the thoughts from you Rob just in that whole international picture that you see as kind of top of the agenda that people should be thinking about Yes. So, I mean, I'd say, I mean, ultimately, it comes back to starting with visibility. You need to understand what the current state looks like. And actually, there's a lot of organizations that can't really define that with any great clarity. You know, things are happening in the way that they've happened um, for years and, and it hasn't been tested in a while. So really getting under the skin of what does what does today look like is key. And then I think it's really about connecting the different stakeholders and helping the different stakeholders within an international organization to understand how their component impacts on others. Um, so if I just look at it through a tax lens for, for a second, you know, transfer pricing rules require related parties to transact with one another at arm's length. Changes in transfer pricing processes and policies have impacts on customs. Sometimes there's benefit there, sometimes there's cost, um, but those parts of the organizations need to be well connected. Likewise, HR strategy drives human behavior and transfer pricing increasingly is focused on the way people behave um, in terms of how those policies then manifest in practice. So changing the HR strategy in a silo from the transfer pricing again creates risk. Um, and then also things like indirect tax. Um, when you're entering a new market, there'll be certain requirements from an indirect tax perspective just to be compliant. Do your systems actually have the functionality to, to enable that? So it's really about getting that visibility of what today looks like, identifying all of the relevant stakeholders, and then finding ways to connect them so that when change is considered in one part of the organization, there's consultation that happens and that can be flowed through to others. And Ross, picking up that point on transfer pricing yeah. the, the start of our session this morning was around inflation and, and costs continually going up have you seen um many of our, our clients many of our contacts it take the time to to relook at some of those points that perhaps they should do because if we stand back and look at the last 12 months it, the, the numbers have moved so quickly in this sector yeah, it, it's hard to keep control of um, even 
insofar as the cost that they have as a business of passing that on to a customer. So in terms of then something like transfer pricing within a group, now is is that something that people are doing? Is it something that people should put top of the agenda? Or do you think it's something that it should just now be on the agenda all the time to, to just at the same time as looking at the price to the customers, they should be looking at their their intergroup transfer pricing agreements and anything else that goes alongside it. Yeah, so I'd, I'd say it's the latter. If, if there's a, a change in price to customers, then um, there should be a, a, a discussion that happens around what how that flows through in terms of uh, the intercompany transactions that that stem from that. And, and does that all still make sense um, in light of that? Because um, there are... Um, there are some some funny situations you can get into um, whereby uh, withholding taxes on gross revenues can have a disproportionate effect on the effective tax rate of the group. And if you're changing pricing and possibly there's change in local regulation as well, which is um, shifting the, the, the or introducing new withholding tax or changing the boundaries of withholding taxes, it, it can fundamentally change your profitability model, which then might lead to a need to consider your contracting model as a whole and maybe a complete overhaul of your transfer pricing policies. So it's definitely something that needs to be that needs to be thought about whether that particular point needs to be top of the agenda or not. Um, I'm not so sure for a number of organizations uh, whether that's that's key. I think the supply chain piece is really key um, at the moment for, for a number of retailers. So that probably sits at the top, but there is inherent interaction with the transfer pricing as soon as you start looking at supply chain and there's there's opportunities for optimization if, if you combine the two together. Um, Stephen, um, picking back up with you and bring our, our discussion to to a close and i should say to the audience um we will be going into a, a wider q a session following this so if you do have any questions either to any of the guys here or any of my uh sex focus colleagues just pop them into the q a function and, and we'll pick those up but Stephen, just coming back to you, you know, we know that 2023 um continues to be a year where people have got to be really focused on the delivery of the performance of the business you know, thoughts from you around where you're seeing big big areas of, of cash leasing, cash inefficiency that people could perhaps think about from a you know a VAT custom point of view as a couple of points of you to take away this morning. Yeah thanks Laura. So just a couple of thoughts from me is to say don't wait until you've got a real crisis to think about your opportunities. And don't wait until a tax authority or someone's come and knocking on your door to think about the threats. So weigh those up. And then the cash flow opportunities really chunk into two different areas, the short term and long term. So in the short term, if you're a business who gets discounts, you know, bulk buy discount volume, prompt payment discounts, and the price of your goods is decreased after importation, you can go to customs, you can go to HMRC and ask for a duty reclaim, you can restate the price and you can do that. Um, there's also opportunity to maybe think about cost, and if you bring your costs down, that brings the, the, the commentary of customs duty down. The other is long term, so two of the big ticket items that we're working on at the minute is inward processing, which is particularly relevant to manufacturing, processing or repair businesses. That suspends customs duty and import VAT at the point of importation, unless you think about what you're going to do with goods. The other, which is particularly useful for distribution companies, is customs warehousing. So you can put goods into a customs warehouse, not pay customs duty until you've released them into the UK market. If you've got global or European distribution, there are significant savings that can be made. Um, and I would say to people, think about pre-ports as well. You've got indirect tax benefits in pre-ports, but also direct tax benefits in relation to saving national insurance and, and, and other taxes. So if you're targeting growth or change, pre-ports can be a real consideration. So if anyone's got any questions on those, you can pick them up in the Q&A or separately, but they're, they're really the, th the three things. What, what are your issues and opportunities? What do your long and short cash flow benefits and what should your supply chain structure look like? Amazing. And with that, I'm, I'm going to thank uh, my colleagues uh, for their time this morning. I think some, some helpful insight uh, into that, and, and I'm sure there'll be more questions as, as we go forward into our wider Q&A. So I'm going to invite the rest of our colleagues back onto to the screen um, and start our, our wider Q&A as we, we finish this morning session. Um, 
one of the things I just wanted to pick up with you, Tom, from from your session, and I know it's been something that you and I have talked at, at length about. You know, we we look at Sophie's high street sales tracker. We see that we've got a landscape now where like for likes are are okay, but for below inflation. So, and then we look to your customer sentiment program and see where people are thinking about spending, how they think about spending. You touched on loyalty programs. You touched on the point of um, are these are these really driving the customer back to the same retailer? Are they giving that customer loyalty? And if we think back to our themes that we mentioned on our last webinar on loyalty being quite a key for, for this year. Make thoughts from you as we enter in this quarter. There's been some really interesting things going on in the market. So it'd be great to hear your, your thoughts and, and sum up with that. Yeah, I, I think the consumer's natural place to um, focus their research is around price, and they are increasingly savvy about where to do that, either in store or online. But any message that actually embarks or persuades the consumer that there's really value at play in offers and discounts, and often that is used using loyalty, then that can be, I think, of significant interest. To the consumer and it does change behaviors and it's only really nudging people to trial you know trial that one thing or, or do that one different thing um and for grocery retail this has been something they've been focused on for years um you know Sainsbury's um try something new all they want to do is add one bit to the basket that campaign's been around for ages the big dent to grocery retailers has been their reduction in the value of their loyalty schemes which i think got a lot of people um, a bit angry and probably saying why why have you just started doing this incredible kind of in-store point scheme when the value is now gone i think people will switch um, away from that and be very price focused and that's where the, the german retailers Aldi, little have been doing really well but for other businesses where you know they aren't having sophisticated loyalty programs and this is more about a a, a kind of conversation with the consumer I think loyalty means different things, and that can often be how they interact with that consumer outside of the purchase. So in the in-store purchase or online, there's an interaction the consumer has, but for everything else, and that's usually, the dialogue is usually an in information or video or content. So if it's an ethical retailer, it's what am I doing with my profits and where am I putting my investments? If it's someone that is more premium, it's how am I actually making the product be the best it can be for you and we're seeing a lot of that in categories like beauty for example so i think loyalty means quite a few different things it's useful it provides content but i think the primary focus for consumers is on headline prices at the moment and that primary focus on sort of headline prices and i guess gaining that customer attention in terms of um KPI data that we're seeing really resonate to people. Um, you know, Laura, just examples that you've had where we're working with clients and we're, we're looking at some of those dashboards. You know, have you seen where people are just really excelling, where they're taking data to the core of everything they're doing? Uh, it's a common theme that we're seeing quite regularly at the moment. And, and again, something worth us just touching on in this morning session. Yeah, definitely. I mean, data is just so important. Um, and, you know, retailers have a wealth of data from various different sources. You know, it's not just financial data. There's all sorts of data from, um, you know, customer feedback and profile demographics of customers. And actually the winners are the businesses that can really take all of that data together and show the trends and how they're interacting that might then lead to some of those answers around um, choices around spend, particular demographics and their spend habits, um, you know, their choices. So it, it's a tricky one. Uh, there's a lot of data out there, but it's all about how you can harness that in the best way and look at those interactions to really tell a story around your customer base, the customer base that you're looking to attract um, and to be quite specific therefore in your in your targeting your products offerings etc and we've we've definitely seen the you know clients that have brought data science scientists in have seen some real benefit and are continuing to see a real benefit of having that that data on on a different type of level using the power bi tools 
to really have those dashboards that that give them at the fingertip you know, the information they need. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. Sorry. Sorry, I was going to say, you know, having a, a data led sort of vision and strategy um, is just so important. You know, there's a lot of decision making that I guess, you know, can be done a little bit from gut in some instances, but, you know, data is just so important and it's a lot easier, I think, um, now to, to really surface that and, and analyze that in a way that can be just so helpful and specific, especially, you know, at the moment within this sector. Whilst I would love to be sat here um, talking around a sector that has moved on from the, the very serious headwinds we've had for, for so many years now, I think it would be remiss of me not to just touch on um, the continuing headlines of some of the challenges that we continue to see in our sector. So, Kiri, just you know, thoughts of, again, what, what are we seeing? What should people look out for on issues that are facing clients where people unfortunately are facing administrators are there any you know, top two tips of things to be wary for yeah so i mean and it's something i think this said previously i think it's about and, and it links to what laura was saying about how important data is but it's really understanding the business and what's happening and having foresight into it we were discussing internally yesterday, a client who's seen an issue six months away. That gives us so many more options and takes so much, some of the pressure off in terms of how we can deal with that. Um, and so how, understanding the forecast, what they look, look like, sensitising them and sort of seeing things down the track really opens things up to us. We've got lots of sort of tools in our toolkit to deal with stress and distress. And so that enables us to do that. Um, and the other point I would talk about is in terms of cost. So we all know there's lots of cost pressure. Some of it has eased, has been, has been touched on. You know, shipping energy for now at least seems to have eased slightly and particularly coming into spring, that helps that out as well in lots of respects. Um, but really monitoring costs and, and you know, some of the tips that the guys have talked through in terms of that being around tax and, and how um, there can be savings and the, the mention of that sort of 8% margin saving as an example. You know, all of these things incrementally, even if they're quite small on their own, can add up and really make a big difference to the long term, and um, particularly um, in terms of working capital and releasing that and making it available for the business. And just picking up the point that Kiwi made there, Neil, you know, arrangements to pay, and perhaps Stephen, uh, Ross, you can add, but you know, arrangements to pay with HMRC, are they still something that um, people should be considering? Is it, is it something where they need help? How, you know, Where's the where's the landscape now as as we carry on through twenty three? Yeah, I mean certainly from my perspective, Laura, it's very different from um, the COVID period. Uh, so time to pay is still there. It is um, a measure you can take if you are in particular difficulties on paying, whether it's about liability, uh, employment tax liability, or for that matter corporate tax liability. I think where we've got to is the revenues perspective is saying, well, if nobody else is going to provide the funding, the cash flow uh, lifeline, why should we be there? So you've got to have a really good um, sort of working capital uh, uh, model to demonstrate they will get their money back if they're going to enter into those arrangements now. So it's much more difficult in some way. Stephen Ross, anything to add to that before? I'd just echo everything that Neil said. That's consistent with my experience as well. I, I think uh, sort of picking up on um, what, what Laura was saying, I mean, I think we covered this on the the webinar before Christmas, but um, there's lots of things that you can do on the on the tax side as well. So you know, Stephen mentioned and Laura mentioned having having really good visibility increases your options. Uh, so I would echo that from a tax perspective. But I think it starts with making sure that what you're putting into to the revenue in terms of submissions is as close to being right first time as you can so that so that you don't end up with any unanticipated issues uh, coming out of the woodwork when you least expect them and then secondly thinking ahead and taking advantage of those opportunities so 
Stephen mentioned the, the G2 release you can access. Ross has mentioned the interaction of um, you know, various things, whether it's transfer pricing and duty, HR policy and uh, uh, incentivization strategies and such like that. So, so actually taking a step back and really thinking about how can I access those opportunities and how can I maximize my cash savings uh, in this uh, area is really important. And just finally on this point, Stacey, you know, dialogue with um, their auditors around that, I suppose speaking of all of the points from, from the session, you know, having really good data yeah, having those conversations around, you know, how things are panning out for the next twelve months. Any, any thoughts just to add to that, as to you know, as people, they they may not be our clients, they may be clients of other firms, but how they should have those conversations with the partners around them to to help them move forward versus um, sort of hiding, as Kimmy was saying, pretending things aren't happening and and hoping they might go away. Yeah, I, I mean, look, ultimately, what do retailers want to do? They want to focus on what their core business. And it's really trying to um, put in place a structure that sort of takes out these blips and volatility, which are outside their control. And to the extent that they can, you know, have those conversations in order to try and manage those blips and volatility so that they can really continue to focus on what their business is all about, about um, creating a, a highly demandable product and servicing their customer in the best possible way. So I, th I think these conversations are key because things are moving so quickly as well and therefore accessing those channels in order to be able to bring that um, expertise and skills um, it, in, into that structure forward it is absolutely key um, and it, it, it is about trying to sort of smooth what we've seen over the these past three to four years in terms of some real blips in that whole um, cost and revenue flows and it's really really difficult to forecast for, forward not only because of the benchmarks but because there's so much uncertainty still, even more so than there was in COVID, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we definitely see that, you know, we're, we're seeing some, some real strength in, in performance, but we're also seeing that people are, are still facing all of those challenges. And you know, we, we certainly as a group are looking forward to the day that, you know, this becomes um, solely about the positive points in the sector. So on that point and moving on, uh, as I think we we typically close our sessions, I'm going to just ask for a couple of words from from everyone on the panel, starting with Ross, of just a few takeaway thoughts. Ross, you know, in in a couple of seconds, what would you say to our audience this morning? Yeah, so for me, I think it would be have have a think about uh, if you were to try and assess the current state of your organisation, how much visibility have you got in relation to that today, and are there areas that warrant um, Sort of looking at uh, again, maybe they haven't been looked at a while for a while, and and in terms of the stakeholders across each of those different areas of the business, how connected are they, and do they need to be more connected um, to help identify the mutual risks and opportunities? Laura, um, yes, yeah, similar to Ross, really. I guess um, for me, life it's it's fast paced, isn't it? But sometimes taking a step back and realizing that change can be a painful thought, but is the right thought. So I think just making time to, to stop, reassess, um, and look a little bit more objectively, even though that's hard when life's busy in this sector. Thank you. It's just keeping that balance be between a, a, a relentless focus on your cost, but also that there is a need to continue to invest going forward in order um, to not only retain, but build for the future. Tom? I would, um, customer acquisition costs are very high at the moment for across channels. I would be focusing on all of your retention and advocacy campaigns. Your customer that just shopped with you is the best advocate for a new uh, customer uh, if they tell someone. And I would be focused on getting those repeat purchases and understanding how to take them as 
um, advocates of your business out into the to the wider public. Yes, and so as not to kind of repeat what I just spoke about, I guess another point would be in terms of keeping your stakeholders close. So taking them on the journey with you, if if you know, times are a little bit tougher, having them in the tent and understanding the business and the journey that it's going on can really save time when it's important to do so. Neil? Uh, in the short term, control what you can control on the tax side as best you can. In the medium term, uh, give yourself some space to think about forward-looking opportunities. Amazing. And finally, Stephen. I think, Laura, most things have been said, but to Neil's point, control and what you can control, look at the supply and value chain relationships you've got and check if they're giving you the best value and just take some time to step back and look at your total tax exposure and think about whether it's optimised. Perfect. So with that, I want to thank everyone for your time this morning. Um, we will be back on the 13th of July. You have contact details there for everyone who's been on the call today. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any one of us. Uh, delighted to pick offline. And we look forward to seeing you in a few months when, as Sophie said, we, we will hopefully be on the right side of the curve to light for light. So have a great day and we'll see you all soon. Thanks. Bye bye.